Commission for the Federal Fiscal Year 2018. LIHEAP is a federally funded program which enables the state to help low-income households meet their home heating needs. LIHEAP is administered by DHS and consists of three components. Cash benefits to help eligible households pay for their home heating fuel. Crisis payments to resolve weather-related supply shortages and other household energy-related emergencies and energy conservation and weatherization measures to address long-range solutions to the home heating problems of low-income households. President Trump's budget proposed to eliminate funding for IDEA. As a result of the President's proposal and the uncertainty that exists around the federal budget at this time, DHS is estimating that Pennsylvania will receive $153.75 million from the fiscal year 2018 federal block grant. That represents a 25% reduction of the fiscal year 2017 allocation. This is a precautionary estimate for planning purposes and does not influence federal appropriations. If funding does remain consistent with recent years, DHS will lengthen the program year and restore benefit levels accordingly. In addition to new funding, DHS anticipates carrying forward a balance of approximately $5 million, resulting in an anticipated total LIHE budget of $158 million. The amount of funds transferred to the Department of Community and Economic Development for the Weatherization Assistance Program will be 15% of Pennsylvania's federal LIHE block grant allocation. DHS is hopeful that funding to this important program will not be cut so that we can continue to serve as many eligible Pennsylvania households as possible. The federal fiscal year 2018 LIHE proposed program parameters are maintaining the income eligibility limit at 150% of the federal poverty income guidelines for both the cash and crisis components. The opening date for LIHEAP cash and crisis components will be November 27, 2017. However, from the federal government recently, and as a result, we are looking, evaluating, increasing our carryover for next season, which will allow us to open the season at an earlier date uh, along the same lines as what we have done previously. Uh, we have just received approval for that, so our season open date will be November 1st. Not November 27th. Uh, the LIHEAP closing date for both cash and crisis components is anticipated to be March 23rd, 2018. The minimum cash benefit amount will be $100. The maximum cash benefit amount will be $1,000. The department estimates approximately 341,312 households can receive a cash component benefit in fiscal year 2018. In regards to the crisis component, the minimum crisis benefit amount will be $25. The maximum crisis benefit will be $400. <coughs> a household may receive more than one crisis grant during the 2018 LIHEAP season, subject to the maximum benefit amount. DHS anticipates approximately 111,400 households can receive a crisis component benefit in the fiscal year 2018. Uh, we anticipate that through this public hearing, your testimony will offer specific recommendations to further enhance the program and provide guidance for the LIHEAP final state plan. As we begin the hearing, I ask that each testifier please limit his or her testimony to five minutes, and we also ask that you provide a written copy of your testimony for our records, if possible, as these proceedings are not recorded. Thank you. Uh, Could I ask you one question? Yes. Uh, you, you said that we got extra funded. How much was the extra funded? Uh, it was about oh, $23 million. $23? Right. Okay. So yeah, that was the remaining 10% that we had not okay, done for the previous season. Okay. That's, that's, okay that's so like good. I said, that allows us to increase our carry. Yeah, but you didn't mention it. So, uh, okay. So the first person scheduled to testify is Patricia King with Pico. Good morning, my name is Patricia King and I'm Manager of Universal Services for PICO 
and Universal Services is the portfolio of low-income programs that is offered by FICO. On behalf of our FICO customers who um, get benef are benefited from our services, I would like to present this testimony regarding the LAHEAP State Plan. Before I address uh, concerns in the plan, I would like to first thank several partners of FICO in helping customers receive LAHEAP grants. I would like to acknowledge the strong support and communication that PICO shares with the Southeastern Pennsylvania County Assistance Offices. Without the help of those dedicated Department of Human Services DHS employees, the LIHE program would fall short of its mission to improve the quality of life for Pennsylvania's individuals and families. I would like to recognize the leadership provided by Dianato Maggi Asi, sorry for mispronouncing the name, Linda Alvarado and Melvin Neal in Philadelphia County, Janice Swashenhofer, Maureen Hahn and Kevin Spicer in Bucks County, Eileen Havlin and Erica Dixon in Chester County, Linda Robinson and Pat Weldon in Delaware County, and Mary Beth Snyder, Nicole Benson and Donna Mayhem in Montgomery County. They continue to provide strong leadership for the program and strive to enhance the quality of life for DHS clients. Additionally, during the past live season, I would like to recognize the leadership provided in Harrisburg and the administration of the program by Kathy Berg and Brian World. Thank you all for your support you've provided to PICO staff and customers. Finally, thank you to Lisa Coral, Jeremy Paul, and the entire staff of the Vendor Health line without your dedicated commitment to the DHS mission many PICO customers would not benefit from the available resources as we have seen in recent months the federal government has proposed a budget for next winter without funding for this needed program I understand the challenges this creates for DHS to forecast a program with great uncertainty my comments to the proposed plan will be brief so I have nine brief points that I would like to point out. Number one, DHS should open the LIHE program on Wednesday, November 1st, 2017, instead of the proposed opening on Monday, November 27th, 2017. Yes, we agree. Okay. Um, second, LIHE cash grant minimum should be maintained at $200 instead of the proposed cut to $100 per grant. LIHE crisis maximum grants should remain at last year's maximum of $500 instead of the proposed $400. Yes. With the uncertainty of federal funding, the state of Pennsylvania should make supplemental resources available to DHS for LIHE grants. Number five, more specific to local LIHE administration, DHS should allow the Philadelphia County Assistance Office locations to all accept LIHE crisis requests instead of centralizing the submission to the 1348 Sedgley Avenue location. Yes. Number six, PICO supports the inclusion of eligibility for secondary heating sources for LIHE grants. Additionally, additionally, sorry, DHS should continue to make clear to applications that the energy assistance is available for their primary or secondary heating source. Number seven, DHS should not include expenditures related to information technology upgrades from the pool of assistance available for grants. Number eight, I ask with the volatility of, of funding arriving from the federal government, DHS be more transparent in contingency planning for spending that funding. And finally, number nine, PICO supports the income eligibility of LIHEAP remaining at 150% of the federal poverty guidelines. So a little bit more on each one of those points. So first, DHS should open the LIHEAP program on Wednesday, November 1st, 2017, instead of the proposed opening on Monday, November 27th, 2017. Opening the program year on Monday, November 27th, does not allow much time for customers with termination notices to apply for LIHEAP crisis grants to restore utility services. I believe this sets a dangerous precedent for future years. Customers that apply for LIHEAP each year are accustomed to having the program open in the beginning of November. I would expect great confusion for customers that normally apply for the program early. Number two. LIHEAP cash grants should remain 
I'm sorry, LIHEAP cash grant minimum should be maintained at $200 instead of the proposed cut to $100. A minimum grant of $200 can assist a FICO customer that participates in our low income programs to stay warm over a much longer period of time. Reducing the program minimum doesn't provide enough assistance for those customers. Number three, LIHEAP crash, excuse me, LIHEAP crisis maximum grants should remain at last year's maximum of $500 instead of the proposed cut to $400. Aside from Pico Electric and natural gas customers, those that have deliverable fuels like oil cannot receive a full tank of oil with a limit of $400. The Pico customers that are eligible for crisis often use this program to spring forward into other low income programs that we offer. Number five, with the uncertainty of federal funding, the state of Pennsylvania should make supplemental resources available to DHS for LIHE grants. The state of Pennsylvania continues to be one of few states that do not provide state supplemental funding for this program. I urge DS DHS to make this known to the administration and ask for additional state funding to be made available. Each winter, PICO, along with other Pennsylvania advocates and utilities, participate in Lockheed Action Day in Washington, D.C. Each year, we tell the congressional delegation that more funding is needed for this program. Providing this supplemental funding is the best way to demonstrate the Commonwealth's shared commitment. Number five, more specific to local LIHEAP administration, DHS should allow the Philadelphia CAO County Assistance Office locations to accept all LIHEAP crisis requests instead of centralizing the submission to the 1348 Sedgley Avenue location. It is PICO's request that additional locations utilized by DHS in Philadelphia County be used to accept LIHEAP crisis requests. Philadelphia is a large city and should use the resources it has effectively. Making customers travel to one location in North Philadelphia creates an unnecessary burden for those that do not travel well. Yes. I ask your consideration in allowing other venues to make available to apply for this needed grant. Number six, PICO supports the inclusion of eligibility for secondary heating sources for LIHEAP grants. Additionally, DHS should continue to make clear to applicants that the energy assistance is available for either primary or secondary heating source. PICO appreciates the DHS commitment to keep the secondary heating source eligible for customers seeking assistance in the LIHEAP program. As we are all aware, without electricity, many, if not all, heating systems will not operate. By keeping the secondary heating source eligible for the customer's ID grant, DHS ensures applicants will be kept warm this winter. Additionally, PICO requests that DHS <coughs> excuse me, make it clear to all county assistance offices workers that if a customer's secondary heating source is inoperable, primary heating sources like natural gas and other deliverable fuels will not work. Number seven, DHS should not include expenditures relating to the information technology upgrades from the pool of assistance available to grants. While section nine in the state plan assures DHS, I'm sorry, allows DHS to expend up to 2% for system upgrades and enhancements, this is not an appropriate use of the grant dollars. I ask that any IT upgrades and enhancements be allocated from the 10% administration budget that is already utilized. Yes. Number eight, I ask that with the volatility, excuse me, of funding arriving from the federal government, DHS be more transparent in contingency planning for spending that funding. In the recent past, the federal government has allocated that LIHE funding has allocated LIHE funding in incremental amounts. If this is a practice for years to come, I ask that DHS provide clear and upfront plans for usage of the funds as they become available. DHS has been excellent at including the LIHE 
advisory, excuse me, committee, but should make its plans known in advance of receipt of funding. For example, if DHS receives X, X million dollars from the federal government during the heating season, the intent would be to provide supplemental grants to this specific population of LIHEAP recipients. And finally, number nine, PICO supports the income eligibility for LIHEAP remaining, remaining at 150% of the federal poverty level guidelines. PICO supports DHS continuing to use the 150% FPL for LIHEAP. By keeping the income thresholds for LIHEAP aligned with the CAP program, customers receiving LIHEAP are targeted for enrollment or continued participation in the CAP program. I would like to thank you again for this opportunity to provide testimony on this essential low income program. You have listened to our concerns and made significant enhancements to the program through this forum and other opportunities. I appreciate that dialogue and the ability to work together with PICO's vulnerable customers and we look forward to a continued collaboration to ensure our low income residents across the state are kept warm this winter. Thank you. Nice. Thank you for those comments, Patricia. You're welcome. Uh, our would like a copy, please let me know. Or uh, our next testifier is Tyra Jackson from PGW. Tyra. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Tyra Jackson, and I'm the Director of Regulatory Compliance at the Philadelphia Gas Works. Within my role, I oversee the Universal Services Department, which administers the assistance programs for PDW's low-income customers. I am here this morning to offer comment on the Department of Human Services' proposed fiscal year 2018 LIHEAP state plan. Before I begin, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the excellent work of the Philadelphia County LIHEAP office and DHS's Office of Income Maintenance during the FY17 grant season. OIM has again performed an excellent job in processing LIHEAP applications in a timely manner, while the Philadelphia County LIHEAP office has continued to demonstrate that they are a reliable partner in the quick and efficient resolution of client issues, particularly for clients in the most vulnerable situations. LIHEAP provides vital assistance to PGW's low-income customers. With the service territory of approximately 500,000 customers, nearly one in three PGW customers are low income and eligible to receive LIHEAP. Therefore, it is clear that PGW and its customers have much at stake in ensuring that the LIHEAP state plan responds to the needs of Pennsylvania's low income households. With the preliminary FY18 federal budget proposing to completely eliminate funding for LIHEAP, PGW appreciates that this proposed plan reflects threat of the funding for the upcoming season. Within this proposed plan, there are various points raised by DHS that PGW supports. For instance, PGW commends DHS on its efforts to increase the number of households that apply for assistance by continuing to operate the early application period. PGW also supports DHS's efforts to continue to open the LIHEAP cash and crisis components at the same time. This process provides vulnerable households with the opportunity to seek assistance, paying their bills, and eliminating their heating emergencies sooner. Conversely, PGW must also express its concerns surrounding many of the proposed changes, proposed changes in this year's plan. We urge the Commonwealth to embrace the change proposed in this testimony because we believe that they will create a more effective and efficient LIHEAP program. Proposed change one, reinstate the opening and closing dates for LIHEAP cash and crisis. According to the proposed plan uh, for fiscal 2018, DHS plans to modify the program opening date for both LIHEAP cash and crisis from November 1st to November 27th. The plan also proposes to modify the closing date for both components from March 31st to March 23rd. PG is concerned with, this, with these proposed changes as many past LIHEAP recipients strongly associate November 1st as the opening date of the program. By modifying the date from the traditional November 1st, this may cause confusion and frustration for many applicants who traditionally apply early. In addition, many vulnerable households depend on LIHEAP to assist with avoiding termination or restoring service before the cold weather approaches. By implementing the proposed changes as outlined in the plan, many households will be forced to experience colder weather before they can apply for assistance. There are similar concerns with modifying the closing date. By moving the closing date up by one week, vulnerable households will be at higher risk for termination in the spring. 
In the past seasons, low-income households had the ability to seek assistance leading up to the beginning of the utility collection season. This provided many households with the opportunity to avoid termination and pay their heating bill. Therefore, PGW proposes that DHS reinstates the November 1st opening date and March 31st closing date for both programs. Yes. Proposed change two, increase the minimum amount for LIHEAP cash back to $200 and increase the LIHEAP crisis maximum back to $500. Within the plan, DHS proposes to reduce the minimum amount for LIHEAP cash as well as reduce the maximum amount for LIHEAP crisis. PGW proposes that DHS reconsiders these proposed changes as they will have a negative impact on grant recipients since a reduced amount means less assistance with heating bills. As a solution, PGW proposes that DHS re reinstate these minimum grant amount, the minimum grant amount for LIHEAP cash back to 200 and the maximum amount of LIHEAP crisis back to 500. Proposed change three, modify the plan language to incorporate all IT costs within the 10% of funding allocated for administrative and planning costs. In FY17, approximately $3 million were used by DHS for system enhancements. Although PGW understands that enhancements are sometimes needed in order to effectively manage the program, the, this funding should not reduce the funds dedicated to assist low-income households. Therefore, PGW proposes that the language in the plan be modified to state that all system enhancements and expenses must be incorporated into the 10% already allocated for administrative and planning costs. The current plan language allows for these type of modifications to come from dollars allocated for grants, which takes real money that could have been used to help potential LIHEAP recipients. By modifying the language in the plan, this change will ensure that low-income customers benefit from funds dedicated for grants. Yes. Proposed change four, eliminate the cash first policy. PGW supports the use of cash grants to help restore service, but only after a household has fully exhausted the maximum crisis grant. The policy of using cash before crisis to resolve what is clearly a crisis situation is at odds with, with, is at odds with federal law's stated purpose for crisis grants, with the historical use of cash and crisis grants, and with DHS's own definition of cash and crisis grants. PGW respectfully asserts that this policy in its current state is an equitable way to treat customers who have a utility emergency. Proposed change five, restrict LIHE cash to the primary heating source. In Pennsylvania, the fundamental purpose of LIHEAP is to help low-income households meet their home heating needs. It is clear that the objective of the program is best met when LIHEAP funds are allocated to the primary heating source, and that is where the bulk of the heating costs are incurred. Allowing an applicant to use LIHEAP resources to pay their electric bill when their primary fuel, fuel source is oil or natural gas subsidizes the applicant's primary electricity costs, such as appliances, summer air conditioning bills, and televisions. While it is true that electricity is required to run an oil or gas heater, the electricity costs of running the heater are a mere fraction of the primary fuel costs. As a consequence, the primary fuel costs are then more likely to fall into arrears and become more difficult to resolve, which will increase service terminations. This is not the intent of LIHEAP. LIHEAP crash cash grants should be used only for the primary source of heat or for a supplemental source of heat if the primary source of heat is inoperable. Proposed change six. Clarify the eligibility of LIHEAP applicants who receive a partial utility subsidy. The proposed plan is not clear about which households receiving utility sub subsidy are eligible for a LIHEAP grant. The plan states that a household is not considered to have a heating responsibility if it is agreed upon that an agency is always responsible for the heating bill. However, many of our customers who live in subsidized housing have the bill in their name and therefore have a heating responsibility even though a fixed utility allowance towards their bill is paid to them by the local housing agency. When that portion does not cover the entire bill, the customer must pay the rest. Therefore, they do have a heating responsibility and should be eligible for LIHEAP. This section should be revised so that it states a household is not considered to have a heating responsibility if it is agree agreed upon that the agency is always responsible for the entire heating bill. Yes. Proposed change seven, include a utility termination program. The proposed plan does not permit a low-income household whose primary source of heat is from a regula regulated utility to receive a crisis grant unless the PC has given the regulated utility specific permission to terminate their service. This policy places customers of regulated utilities in a potential harmful situation and imposes an unfair burden upon them. To remedy this, PGW proposes that DHS modify this current language in the plan to allow customers of regulated utilities who have a termination notice in effect until April 1st, 2018 or later 
to use that notice as proof of a home heating emergency when applying for crisis and to obtain assistance if otherwise eligible prior to that date so that the termination can be prevented. Doing so will ensure that low-income households have the chance to avoid termination on ser of service on April 1st or shortly thereafter. And then just an additional comment, PGW pledges strong outreach campaigns. PGW will continue its commitment to implement a strong and thorough outreach campaign this upcoming season. We will also continue to work with the department, the city, and low-income advocates to improve coordination between the cash and crisis portions of the LIHE program and other assistance programs in Philadelphia. We are particularly interested in working with the department on identifying opportunities to streamline the application process, to reduce the need for hard copy documentation of support of LIHEAP and crisis grant applications, and to engage in information sharing for the benefit of our customers. Conclu in conclusion, PGW, PGW and other regulated utilities are doing their part to assist low-income families struggling to keep their homes warm and safe. Collectively, customers of regulated utilities in Pennsylvania contributed more than $418 million in 2015 to their universal services programs, programs created to assist low-income families by providing discounted bills, arrearage forgiveness, and weatherization. More specifically, of that number, PGW's non-CAP customers contributed more than $65 million to help low-income families afford their gas bill. Even with the availability of our CAP, PGW customers still rely on light cash and crisis to help pay for heating costs and resolve heating emergencies. Last year, tens of thousands of households who received these grants were able to restore service, avoid service termination, and pay their gas bills. However, we know that more work is needed, as not all customers who might have benefited from LIHEAP received a grant. PGW look forward to working closely again this year with the department and with the very capable staff at Philadelphia's County Assistance LIHEAP office to facilitate LIHEAP cash and crisis applications. This concludes my remarks, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to address you today. Thank you for those comments, Simon. Uh, our next speaker is, I don't have a first name, I just have a first initial, M. Gonzalez from the Energy Coordinator Agency. My name is Mari Gonzalez, and I'm here representing the um, NC, the Neighborhood Energy Center, uh, Energy, sorry, Neighboring Energy Centers, and um, the ECA, the Energy Coordinating Agency. Um, we are writing strongly. We are writing to strongly propose a drastic cuts that the DHS has proposed for the next LIHE season, including cutting grants amounts and closing the season early. While all of these proposals are harmful, none was more dangerous than the November 27th opening. Thank you for reconsidering this, and this is a big step in the right direction. We strongly urge DHS to make all the changes, to make all the changes, uh, sorry. We strongly urge DHS to make changes to all of the proposed LIHEAP cuts. The Energy Coordinating Agency helps manage 14 neighborhood energy centers in the, in the city. The centers have a wide coverage of the city, and almost all of the centers are located in one of the city's top 10 poorest zip codes. The NEC model thrives off a community-based network of organizations, both big and small, working together as a team. These centers provide services such as bill payment assistance, access to energy conservation programs, and energy education. The 14 organizations have partnered up with us to be centers and each specializes in, in services which complements our mission of making energy affordable for all. For instance, some specialize in housing programs, such as NKCDC, ASE, Achievability, and Congresso. Others are well known for their deeply rooted community work, such as Germantown Crisis Ministry, Nightstown CDC, Hunting Park, NAC. Some are known for the work with immigrants, such as GPAS and United Communities. Many of them, like Southwest CDC, work closely with their senators and local representatives for the betterment of their community. Some, like Center in the Park, work with some of the most vulnerable yet resilient communities, such as our senior citizens. Lastly, all of them just refuse to turn a single person away and have fought hard to make sure every family they reach has access to basic needs, such as heat. 
prime example being our mighty We Never Say Never. All together, we work towards increasing the quality of life for all Philadelphians by taking a holistic approach when approaching, when trying to solve and prevent crisis-like situations. Given that we came about in the 80s in response to tens of thousands being shut off while lot heat monies were being sent back to the state, we see it as our duty to once again represent, many years later, those same vulnerable populations. We also bring this up to point out that even though all lot heat funds are not spent, it does not mean that there aren't people in need of lot heat funds. Shutoffs are still happening. People in Philadelphia are still struggling to get by. And because of this, people are eventually being displaced when they can no longer hold their heads above water. By not distributing all the funds due to the fear of running out of funds, the very people we are trying to help, we are failing. We urge DHS to make the following changes to its proposed LIHEAP plan. Number two, which was originally number one. Keep LIHEAP open at least to April 1st. DHS proposes to close LIHEAP early on March 23rd denies low-income families the opportunity to access heating assistance before the winter moratorium on utility shutoff ends on April 1st. Utility companies once again ramp up termination activities in the months before April 1st, eating end of mor moratorium, and then follow up through with utility shutoffs starting April 1st. Families need those five business days to prevent a loss of service. We must keep in mind that unlike neighboring states, Pennsylvania does not have a readily accessible cooling program via LIHEAP in the summer. So if, the, so if an individual has a balance that carries over into the summer months where there is less assistance available to prevent termination, they are at risk of going the entire summer without proper cooling. Given that climate change is real and it is happening now, we will be seeing hotter days more consecutively. There are families in Philadelphia and very likely in other parts of the state that enter the summer already in crisis. Just a few weeks ago, I had a senior call me because her electricity was being shut off on a day that was expected to feel like 104 degrees. Unfortunately, had a bill of over $800 racked up from the heating season. She lived alone in a one-bedroom apartment, could not physically make it to her nearest cooling center. Other the other funds and options to assist the senior were depleted, and she was waiting on a letter from a doctor to turn on her electricity. Thanks to the neighbors and one of our counselors, Yvette Velez from the center in the park, we were able to keep the senior safe and get her through those hot days. Yvette and I called the senior after working hours to make sure she was still safe. But if it wasn't because the senior had good neighbors and Yvette was able to advocate to expedite her letter, I'm not sure what other options she would have been left with. We urge DHS to keep LAHEAP open at least until April 1st. Number two, increase grant amounts. Low-income families often are asked to pay high percentage of their income on utility costs, and all year families struggle to afford this energy burden. LIHEAP season often provides families with one chance to catch up. With lower grant amounts, that would be much harder to do. For example, DHS proposes cutting the maximum available amount of crisis amounts from $500 to $400. Since utility companies often reject crisis grants when the grant is less than the total amount owed, a cut from $500 to $400 could prevent families from being able to benefit from the LIHEAP, from LIHEAP and keep their heat on for the winter. The proposal also eliminates the supplement payments available for the most vulnerable families, households with seniors, people with disabilities, and young children. These families are prone to dangers of loss of heat and need relief from the high energy burden. Reducing cash, cash and crisis amounts will hit needy families hard and make it dif more difficult to keep up with their utility payments for the, the entire year. We urge you to keep the grant amounts from the 2016 to 2017 LIHEAP season or increase them and to keep supplement grants for vulnerable households. In Philadelphia, we have been very fortunate to have our three major utilities, PICO, PGW, and P PWD, work closely with organizations such as CLS, USEF, Pulp, and ourselves towards creating more sustainable options for low-income families. The Mayor's Office of Sustainability and the City's Health Department, along with the PUC, have been working proactively to prevent displacement of families and, keeping them and working towards keeping them safe in their homes. Most of, our, most of my experience working with families in need and during crisis has been in Philadelphia. 
but I've been able to live in other parts of the states long enough to know that not everyone has these many advocates to turn to. Also long enough to know that the winters get colder and longer the more north you go. And although poverty can, although poverty can take on different shapes, the, the need is still the same. I've also lived long enough in Philadelphia to know that even with all these organizations working together to find solutions and create options, there are still many in need to fall through the cracks. I hope that you will take this information and do what's best for all Pennsylvanians, which is to start like heat no longer November 1st. Thank you for that. Keep it open to at least April 1st and increase the grants amounts. Thank you for this opportunity to, to submit these comments. Thank you for those comments. Uh, our next speaker is Mary Pat Pileggi from Community Legal Services. Thank you. Hello, everyone. <laughs> I'm so glad to see all of those faces out there. This is a great turnout. Thank you all for coming. And thank you all. Thank you, DHS. Um, <clears throat> for holding this hearing today. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Community Legal Services provides free legal services to low-income folks in Philadelphia. We represent thousands of families every year who are struggling with unaffordable energy bills and who are uh, trying to access DHS services to keep the heat on, uh, get safe uh, housing, and uh, get food to eat. Um, our work brings us into contact every day with the urgent issues of energy affordability and access to benefits faced by so many people in Philadelphia. I'm testifying today on behalf of our clients. So I have been a LIHEAP advocate for 10 years, over 10 years, um, and this proposal this year uh, was the most dangerous proposal that I've ever seen from DHS on LIHEAP. The most dangerous proposal was the November 27th opening, and I'm very, very, very pleased to hear that DHS has, um, has changed their position on that one, and will be opening on November 1st. We thank you very much for that. Um, I do want to just say very quickly that a, a, the potential decrease in federal funding um, it would, would never justify cutting people off from LIHEAP in November. The potential for harm is just too great. You know, we all know, right, in November, the weather, the cold weather sets in, um, the energy bills go up, and utility termination notices go out in force, right? November is a critical time of the light heap year, um, and it's the one time of year when DHS should ensure maximum access to light heap, not cut people off. So we urge DHS to um, follow through with the commitment it made today to open light heap on November 1st, regardless of what happens between now and November 1st in terms of funding. Um, in addition, we also urge DHS to raise grant amounts, which we've heard about today already from other folks. All year, low-income people in Pennsylvania um, are struggling to afford home energy because there is an energy affordability crisis in Pennsylvania, uh, one in Pennsylvania that, we, that our neighboring states don't know in the same way. Um, uh, Low-income utility customers in Pennsylvania are regularly expected to pay up to 17% of their monthly income on utility bills. This is four times higher than the average Pennsylvanian spends on utility bills and three times higher than what low-income people are spending in our neighboring states of Ohio and New Jersey, just to give two examples. So uh, the, uh, the energy burdens, the, 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 sh the stress and the pressure that that puts on low-income families in Pennsylvania is real. Um, and 17% uh, and it, it, is above any reasonable energy burden that anyone should be expected to pay. Um, experts from across the country agree that anything over 6% is too high. So 17% is like almost three times as, as uh, uh, too high. Um, LIHEAP provides those families who are struggling to make ends meet the one chance they get all year to, ca to catch up and to get an energy burden that's something closer to reasonable and affordable. So when you lower grant amounts, people have a much harder time catching up 
and they can't reach those affordable, affordable energy burdens. We really strongly urge you to raise those grant amounts to give people a chance. <coughs> Similarly, DHS's proposal to close LIHEAP early this year on March 23rd will deny low-income families the opportunity to access heating assistance before the winter moratorium on utility shutoffs ends on April 1st. Utility companies, um, we all know, though anybody who deals with them know, right? They ramp up those termination, act termination activity in the months before the April 1st end of the moratorium and then follow through, through with those utility shutoff termination notices on April 1st. Um, giving folks, these families struggling to make ends meet, those few extra business days to get LIHEAP to ensure that those termination notices can be canceled and they can keep service on into the spring is uh, very important and we urge uh, DHS to keep the LIHEAP season open at least until April 1st. Yes, 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 yes. Um, we understand that DHS has proposed these drastic cuts this year in an attempt to save LIHEAP funds, right? Our suggestion, though, is that if LIHEAP funds need to be saved, DHS should first look to itself to increase its own efficiency to save LIHEAP dollars, and then also look to utility companies. Make sure that utility companies are doing their part to maximize LIHEAP benefits for LIHEAP recipients before DHS turns to struggling families and asks them to accept reduced grant amounts or a shortened LIHEAP season. DHS can avoid needless duplicative application processing by allowing food stamps, cash assistance, and Medicaid applicants to apply for LIHEAP as part of one application process instead of forcing people to do two. People who are eligible for those other benefits and who are responsible for home energy will almost always, always also be eligible for LIHEAP. So allow people to apply for all benefits at once. There's no need for an entirely separate LIHEAP application process for those families. DHS can also avoid processing multiple LIHEAP applications for a single applicant by requiring utility companies to accept crisis grants the first time they are offered. Currently, utility companies can choose to refuse a crisis grant, which will send a family scrambling to find additional funds, all while living without heat at home, before the family can then go back and apply for LIHEAP crisis again, and maybe even again and again, um, two or three times after that. Um, if DHS would require utility companies to just accept that crisis grant the first time it's offered, and then require the utility companies to then work with the family to figure out a payment arrangement for whatever debt uh, still exists after heat is turned back on, they'd save the family from a life without heat, and then they'd save themselves from having to process multiple LIHEAP crisis applications for a single crisis grant. Um, these are just two examples, right? DHS can fix these needless wastes of time and LIHEAP administration dollars, um, which will also make LIHEAP work better for struggling families and make more funds available for more people to get the help they need. Um, I will have full written comments on the full plan to submit on July 14th. And I want to remind everyone that full written comments are not due today. So if you don't have them today, or you hear something else that you <laughs> want to comment on today, you can put them in writing and submit them to DHS by July 14th. Um, I will be doing that. Before I leave, I just have a couple comments about the hearing itself today. Like I said, I'm really glad to see all of you folks. And um, I have a few comments on the hearing itself. So we really urge DHS to find a time and a place for the LIHEAP public hearing that will pr permit more Philadelphians to come out, more Philadelphia LIHEAP recipients, more Philadelphia LIHEAP advocates uh, to attend. LIHEAP recipients live in Philadelphia neighborhoods, uh, in North Philly, South Philly, Southwest, Northeast, um, but these public hearings are always held in Center City only. We really encourage DHS to find a place in a Philadelphia neighborhood where LIHEAP recipients live CLS has offered our North Philly office as, a, as, a, as an option. Um, I'm sure there are other folks here from, from neighborhood organizations who would have other ideas about uh, neighborhood venues and forums where these, these hearings could be held in the future. Also, this is Philly, the birthplace of the country. July 4th is a big holiday here. Um, holding these hearings the day after July 4th holiday uh, presents a lot of obstacles to meaningful participation. 
we feel very strongly that life hearings should be held at least a week after July 4th, after folks yes. with their vacations and their yes. celebrations. Yes. Uh, finally, about the hearing, public transportation, SEPTA, <laughs> um, is the main way that people get around in Philly. This library is wonderful um, and it's beautiful, but it's also several blocks from the nearest, nearest subway stop. Um, why keep hearings should be held somewhere close to the subway. Um, before I step down and give the next person a uh, chance, I want to draw everyone's attention to the last page on this handout that DHS has up here. Um, and I want to give DHS credit for including this. You all have heard, and I know that you've heard this before even today, but the president has proposed to eliminate LIHEAP for the next season, uh, for next year, um, which is terrible, right? LIHEAP, we all know, is an effective, vital program um, that helps families struggling to make ends meet. We are lucky in that um, we live in a cold weather state where LIHEAP enjoys some bipartisan support, right? But our representatives need to hear from us about why LIHEAP is so important and effective and it works and we need to, to stick around. So the DHS has included that information on the back of this um, flyer, so grab one, give a call to your senators and your Congress people. Um, we need to keep LIHEAP around. Um, thank you. Scheduled speaker is Corey Tice. Hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Corey Tice. I'm a social worker. I work with a network of health centers that serve uh, low income individuals and families um, across Philadelphia, many of whom are medically frail and living with chronic health conditions. Uh, I'm here to testify on behalf of the uh, populations of clients with whom I work. So to summarize the consequences of the proposed LIHE policy changes, uh, coupling a reduction of time for the application period with a reduction in grant awards puts our clients, particularly our populations of seniors, medically frail, and families with very young children, at higher risk for accrual of high energy, excuse me, high energy debt and heating shut off, subsequently compromising their physical health. We know that the financial health of individuals and families has effects on their physical and mental health, often impeding their ability to pay for needed medical expenses, including visit and medication co-pays. Often low-income individuals and families will choose between visit, I'm sorry, will choose between paying the heating bill or seeking medical care. If our patients' LIHEAP grants are reduced or the deadlines are missed, they may choose to skip their medical or behavioral health appointments to divert this money to the cost of their heating bills. Additionally, access to continuous refrigeration is important for people on certain medications. For those utilizing electricity as a primary heating source, the <clears throat> proposed changes could subsequently jeopardize their electricity access and then thus their continued ability to refrigerate these life-sustaining medications. So I just wanted to comment then specifically on some of the policy changes. Um, I did have comments regarding the delay of the LIHEAP application start date, um, but with DHS's commitment to um, going back to the November 1st um, start date, I just wanted to thank you for that. So we're looking forward to seeing LIHEAP starting November 1st. Um, in regards to the closing of LIHEAP on March 22nd, I'm sorry, 23rd instead of April 1st, um, the potential negative consequences to our clients include um, our clients needing access to LIHEAP until at least April 1st when the winter shutoff moratorium ends and utility companies uh, widely restart shutting off people's services. So some of our patients that struggle with financial maintenance may not fully be aware of the amount owed on their heating bill until after receiving the shutoff notice. Uh, and that's usually happening closer to that April 1st uh, period. At this point, LIHEAP applications will ha have already been closed for a week. Additionally, many Philadelphia citizens who are used to applying for LIHEAP and used to that April 1st uh, end date may not be aware um, of the uh, change in that date. Um, a lot of our folks that we work with don't have access to social media outlets or media outlets and have low literacy, and they may not be fully aware. So. Um, they jeopardize um, being able to apply for LIHEAP um, during that last week. Uh, reducing the LIHEAP maximum grant amounts. Um, 
LIHEAP recipient individuals and families often have very high energy burdens. LIHEAP sees and often provides our families with one chance to catch up on the bills, but with lower grant amounts that will be much harder to do. Seniors, people with disabilities, and families with young children are especially vulnerable to the dangers of the loss of home energy <clears throat> and sorry, home energy relief um, from their high energy burdens. Again, high energy bills can potentially force households with limited and fixed incomes to choose between heating and medical care, uh, which as I explained previously, creates a cycle of detrimental health risk. So those are just some of my comments. I wanted to conclude by thank you for this opportunity to share and explain these important concerns of our low income and our most vulnerable citizens and um, urge you to take these into account as you consider the other, um, other policy changes. Thank you. Uh, thank you for those comments. As I said, that was our last scheduled speaker. Uh, we do still have a lot of time available, so if anybody else has any comments they'd like to submit, we will be here until 12. Please feel free to step up and speak. Um, I would like to also point to what Mary Pat had said about the state plan. We do continue to accept comments on those until July 14th. They can be submitted. We will be updating the state plan with the new start date uh, once we are back in the office. So. Uh, that should be updated sometime, hopefully, by the end of this week, correct? Yeah. So. Are there any other who would like to submit comments at this time? Oh. Hi, uh, my name is Eileen Wexler. Eileen? Yes. Um, I live here in Philadelphia, I haven't lived here that long, and I would just like to say that um, you know, I appreciate the efforts um, in trying to um, help people with these programs, and but maybe we wouldn't need so many of these if the cost of the utilities weren't so high to begin with. Um, I rent here, I have a one bedroom apartment, um, I own a three bedroom house in Penya, New York, my utility bills for my one-bedroom apartment are substantially higher than for my three-bedroom house in Penya, New York. And I don't really understand that, but, you know, that's just how it is. But if people didn't have to pay so much for their utilities, maybe they wouldn't need so much help. And that's all I'd like to say. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you. My name is Antonia Banks. I'm a United States military veteran. Uh, I um, have done more than my fair share of community service when I had left Charleston, South Carolina years ago to continue to raise my um, only child back up here in Philadelphia. Um, with much too much of bill, um, we have, to a certain to a certain limit, once in a while, benefited from LAHEAP. And I live in a community where there are quite a few uh, young adults, some who are employed and trying to make it, and they have several very small children themselves. Um, I don't know if that terminology that used to be used about uh, third world country persons applies still, but it appears that we are rescinding back into what was considered a third world country situation if we deprive our uh, citizens who are trying to get out there and still do what they're supposed to do in order to keep a household together, raise their children, and thrive in Philadelphia like normal people should. Um, I would hate to see them to have to rescind. Uh, for those of us who have um, uh, a need in the future possibly for uh, the usage of um, the light heat program. If we have breathing disorders, the air conditioning portion of it can be of great assistance to many of us. And we would really appreciate if they can concern themselves uh, through DHS that 
you know, we deserve to live too. If I can turn around and serve my country, yes. the least I should have is yes. the ability to still breathe. Yes. Thank you. And, thank you. And last but definitely not least, um, I will think that if we could appeal to um, the President of the United States, Donald Trump, I don't know what his take is on how he reviewed people who have served their country, but I don't feel so it's just necessarily uh, something that applies to only us, just as human beings and as citizens of this country that we serve. Um, we would appreciate if he would tef definitely not pull the cord on those of us who are less fortunate and barely capable of surviving, while others uh, who have the luxury of doing what they can and uh, acquiring dollars to be able to receive those basic things, necessities to live, that they would have President Trump to understand we're not asking for freebie because we know in the real world their grants are being dispensed constantly on a daily basis that are going to frivolous grants out here for things like studies that are like outrageous. And if they can turn around and put millions and sometimes billions into that, why can't they invest maybe maybe multi-millions to the maximum to something just to keep the people who are representing our country and who believe in our country stable? And with this being said, Laheep, it will be appreciated if you can maintain it, um, Mr. Trump, especially because we really do need this for the sake of just mere existence. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Hello. Hello. How's everybody doing today? Good. Good. Uh, I don't have anything written down. I just have my experience. And um, my name is Anthony Davila. D A V I L A. I work for Hase, based in the Fair Hill St. Hugh area. We also have an office in Frankfurt section serving in the Northeast area, Philadelphia. Um, most of our clients, when I speak for a couple next in here, most of our clients live off a of fixed income, our senior citizens. Every dollar is counted to the point. And uh, their life is supposed to be lived a certain way where this amount of money goes to rent, this amount goes to utilities, this amount goes to food, and the rest goes to whatever we can afford at that point. Most of my clients have a steady uh, fixed income of 735 a month. According to the PA, Child support system, the self survival rate is $880 a month. So if you make less than that, technically you don't have to pay child support. And um, if that's a self survival rate, and most of our clients are coming in at $735 a month, I mean, technically they fall below the self survival rate, it's mandated by the law here in PA. So basically, bringing it all together, our clients are already living on a fixed income, most dependent on LIHEAP and crisis to get them out of that struggle that they, you know, to give them that little bit of break, to, to do something just a little bit different at one point during the year, whether it be catch up on this, catch up on that, or maybe even fix something in their home because their income is so tight right now and throughout the year that they can't afford to fix a plumbing issue or an electrical issue or a roofing issue, a window issue which basically all equal out to increasing their utility cost. So by cutting that, by cutting LIHEAP even more in cutting it all together next year, are we saying that we're supposed to live a perfect life and that life is not supposed to happen because things happen? This is, hello, you know? We're here today when our home could be our roof could be leaking, window could be broken. My grandparents need windows in their house, you know? So they have to crank up the heat in the winter a little more, costing them a little more. 
Uh, they, they can't predict the weather. And so life is basically not supposed to happen because nothing bad should happen because you basically only have this amount of money to spend. So there's no room for surprises. There's no room for life to happen as it normally does. And I'm just, again, I'm just saying this because I got clients that are senior citizens that come to my office with a $32 electric bill and can't afford it. Meanwhile, there's folks spending $32 at McDonald's after work. But I got somebody that, that $32 determines whether or not they're gonna be warm for the next 30 days. To the point, I'm 26 years old. I've worked all my career, professional career in nonprofits, dealing with the community, in the community, helping people um, weatherize their homes with the help of ECA and all our partners. And it's just, you know, these are things that some folks just don't see because they're not in the mix of it. Whereas me and my colleagues in different agencies and we're in the, in the heart of it all. Some of us are recipients of LIHEAP. I got it last year because I couldn't afford my gas bill, whatever. But the thing is, the point I'm trying to make is that the folks that want to cut it are not the folks that need it. And this is in no direct way at you guys or anybody. It's just on paper, things look a lot better. But let us walk you through our neighborhoods. Let us introduce you to our neighbors. Let us show you what we deal with on a daily basis. I got clients with three or four kids that are living off seven fifty a month. Food stamps only buy you food, which is great. But even that is getting cut short soon. Our clients technically can't afford to live, but we're not offering them any more resources. We should be upping the amount of help. Yes. But the people up top don't know that because yes. they're not in the bottom where we are. You know, there's days I got to come to work in jeans and sneakers because I know I got to help one of my residents get off the bus and walk to her apartment. Sometimes I have to help them pay for certain things. When there's no funding available, your heart, your instinct kicks in and you're like, well, it's only 32 bucks. I guess I can help you now because I'm up. But either way, um, Again, I didn't address any direct points. I do have a testimony that I'll make sure I'll send you guys. That'll be a better worded than this. But um, speaking from the heart, speaking from my area, being a kid that lived the whole year of his life with no gas, no water in his house. I mean, you cut this like the sign says, you know. Some people are really going to struggle from it. And uh, a lot of people fall behind when these things happen. Because maybe their bill is $200 and that one LAHI payment is gonna get them where they need to be to get on that lower payment arrangement that's gonna set them straight for the next couple months. But we don't, certain people don't understand that because for some folks that have a very strong hand in these kind of things, it's just a signature that they need to put on a piece of paper and boom, everything's gone. Where for my folks, my neighbors, my community, that signature just signed off on whether or not we're going to be warm, whether or not we're going to have cooling, whether or not the refrigerated medicine stays refrigerated. That's major, really good. major. I've had to put one of my residents' medicine in my in my refrigerator while we waited for a lot heap and crisis to go through, or to mix them all together so we can get this person back up and running. I mean, you cut that, you cut funding the LAHI, you cut funding the crisis, you basically cut someone's life, life, not life, but you definitely cut someone's somewhat comfortability for a long period of time. Man. Come out, come out. Um, I got my, all of our necks, ECA, We'll, we'll gladly walk you through and introduce you to some of our regulars because our clients are mostly regulars because they regularly need help and we are to regularly help them find it. So, I mean, for the sake of our community 
in the community of my colleagues reconsider? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Freda, upside down. Everyone. It's upside down. My name down. is Ryan Rex. I'm from the F Wack and Hunt Company. I'm here with the ECA this morning. Um, I've experienced the other side of things a little bit, being a plumber and a heating and air conditioning contractor. I've been going to somebody's house and tell them when I get a desperate call in the middle of the night that, sir, we don't have heat, we don't have air conditioning, can you come out and help me? And I have to go out and find that there's no gas in the house, there's no electric, and I have to be the one to break the news to these people. Um, you know, being on the other side of it, not having heat. If you're an elderly person or a family of small children, it's one of the worst things you can do, right? Because in the wintertime, that's when illnesses spread, and summertime, that's when heat strokes happen. So, I just, uh, I really think it's important what's happening here today and the extension of these dates and the increases in this grant money and how much it can help people. So, just knowing things from my perspective, um, I can see it from your perspective, I can see it from a person's perspective in the house and how difficult it is and, and how important these points are today. Thank you. Come on up. Come on up. Nervous right now. <laughs> um, okay, so I uh, I'm deeply saddened that I'm here today. Um, uh, actually, yesterday I was told by um, a non uh, non government voluntary organization that I work for called ESWA. Um, they called me because they thought as though this would be vitally vitally important to me um, to come to this hearing and speak to this panel on behalf of uh, uh, special needs adults um, and special needs children in Philadelphia, in the Philadelphia area and surrounding counties. Um, so that would include myself. I am the survivor so far, by the grace of God, um, of 11 neurosurgeries. Um, that's why my home care assistant is here. <laughs> um, and my son is autistic with other neurological disorders. Um, but he's, he's amazing. He's, 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 by through the grace of God, he's doing great. Um, so with that, I'm shocked that I'm here because um, the government is actually thinking about, or um, so, um, actually thinking about um, cutting um, or abolishing LIHEAP I mean, AIM crisis. Um, I'm shocked because this would greatly affect, I don't know if you guys know this, but um, there is like well over, close to, 50,000 children, special needs children, in Philadelphia alone, okay? And I got this from Elwin because I used to work at Elwin before I had my neurosurgery um, and my um, seizures before I had that. I worked there and um, I was educated and I worked with special needs families and so forth, which helped me tremendously to fight my own battle to make sure that my son gets the proper services that he needs. Um, but there are, there are like 50,000 kids, um, families, that um, 
their needs, their great needs, needs, like he. They're on a very fixed income like myself. I'm on SSDI. I'm permanently on SSDI. My situation is not going to change. I'm on a very fixed income. I don't receive child support. I don't receive, um, actually my job terminated me while I was in the hospital. So um, all I have is SSDI. And I rely on Lahib in crisis from time to time. Um, I had to go to community legal services recently because um, you know, during a year, crisis and my heat were not available, so you have to go to other resources. The point is that this is a resources. This is a resource for low-income families. I can only speak for special needs families, and I have to tell you, being on a very fixed income um, is extremely hard and is very stressful. It's beyond stressful. You have no idea. Um, when you don't receive any extra help and you just trying to make ends meet um, from on a daily basis, um, it's, it's just very difficult. Um, there's more I wanted to say. My train of thought is not the greatest. Um, but um, I feel as though God put people in your life for a reason and it just so happens that my home care assistant, Nakira, she has um, two children with special needs. So I tend to be an advocate for her and um, try to help her. Um, so she will be also greatly affected by this, as well if uh, Lahib in crisis, um, if, if it's abolished. Um, but like I said, there's 50,000 kids special needs. I can't speak for families with um, typical children. Um, and I'm saying 50,000 that has been diagnosed. I'm not talking about the families that have not been diagnosed. Okay, they haven't even been diagnosed yet, but there's a lot of families that um, are in denial um, and, and kind of swept underneath the rug. They, they don't want to believe that, hey, my child actually has a neurological disorder, um, which is sad. But it is what it is. Um, so that's 50,000 families, and it would hurt them greatly. It would hurt me greatly. You know, like I said, I rely on, I rely on it. I try to make ends meet. I'm on a very, very fixed budget, but I need help from time to time. And I, my heat and crisis, um, they come through, and I'm very, very appreciative. I'm very thankful, and I try to just keep budgeting as much as possible. Um, to make ends meet on a monthly basis, you know, but it's just myself and my son. So it's, it's, it's difficult from time to time, you know. Um, Nakira, you want to say anything? Or? No. No. <laughs> okay, um, yes, so uh, thank you so much um, for listening to me. I, I really appreciate that. Thank you. My name is Sandra Evers, and I went three months without no electricity. I have a disability of retinal kidney failure. Um, my um, LAHEAP is a good program, and it benefits a lot of people. And if it went for the community legal service and going through, I still will be without electricity, but I'm not because I'm trying to work with it now and get it erased from it. <laughs> so I don't have to deal with it. But um, she called me, told me to come here today. And the disability alone with kidney failure and being on dialysis is very hard. And it's a more of a eating process. I'm restricted from a lot of things and has to be refrigerated. I don't know how I survived three months without no electricity, but I did. 
give a lot of that to God and just being strong and going through what I need had to go through. But um, I did it and I'm here. And thank you for having me come here for to speak for LIHE. And it is a great program and it's needed all over. I don't understand Mr. Trump, but he's Mr. Trump. <laughs> so um, I hope he's, he does not cut the program. And it's a very beneficial program and he needs to understand more of what he's doing instead of being the clown that he is. Thank you. Hi, right, good morning. My name is Karen E. Wheeler. Um, I wasn't planning on saying anything. I was just planning on coming here and sit and listen. But while sitting there, my soul, my spirit said to me, get up and share your testimony. So I come here as the face of what our society calls the working poor. We get up every morning, we go to work, and we do our job. And while we get up and we go to work and we are responsible, we're not asking for a handout because we want to be responsible and we want to be able to pay our bills every month. Unfortunately, because of the minimum wage that we may receive, that's not always possible. And despite what society and some in this administration say, referring to us as being lazy and looking for a handout, that is not the case. So programs like LIHE help those who are the working poor. Um, the administration calls itself the administration of wanting to make America better. I don't know what they consider making America better, but programs like LIHE help to make America and Americans better. Yes, yes. So, while my neighbors were recovering from Hurricane Sandy, having their electricity off, I had to wear the mask and pretend that my electricity too was off because of Hurricane Sandy, but that was not the case. My electricity was off because of the fact that I was not able to keep up with paying my bill because I was the primary caregiver for a mother who had Alzheimer's disease. And because of that, I was no longer able to maintain a full-time paying job that I had that I was able to be in a certain income level and not have to be dependent upon programs like LIHEAP. But things happen, as the young man said, things happen, life happens, and things change. And if it were not for programs like LIHEAP helping me and others to be able to keep up and to pay our payments, I probably would still be sitting in a house with no electricity. So I say that. Um, again, I was not planning on speaking, but my soul said to me, get up and say something. And with that, I just want to say one other thing. I don't mean to offend anyone by the next thing that I'm about to say, but based upon my religious belief, um, scripture says um, in Jesus' words that the poor will always be with us, but I will not. And programs like LIHEAP help the poor the way that Jesus helped the poor. Thank you. You can come on up. Good morning. My name is Kim Jackson. And I had no intentions on coming here, but I spoke to Freda. She uh, is a, a, the director at Eastern Services, and I have been a volunteer there along with taking my participants. So let me just say that I work for Elwyn, Philadelphia Elwyn, and 
I was appalled about Lahi being cut. Prior to working for Elwyn, I worked for the Department of Human Services where we worked with disadvantaged families that really relied on Lahi for many years. So I'm not understanding why this new administration wants to cut any program for the poor because we rely on this program that has made, it's been very successful. Now, everybody is not making $2 million a year. I'm quite sure I'm not making even 50000 a year. So having said all that, I think that the new administration needs to consider the poor and stop worrying about the haves. Yes, we yes. We are the have-nots in their minds. Yes. And at this time, I think LIHEAP and any other program, aside LIHEAP, I'm talking about health care as well. Yes, don't, don't get yes, on yes, that. yes. We need Medicare just as we need LIHEAP. So they need to reconsider, sit at the table, and act like adults and keep these programs in place. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Any more comments? Not me running the floor, but I'm just... <laughs> like I said, we're, we're here until 12. So, I mean, if you're still gathering yourself to say something, we still have 40 minutes. So, uh, at, at any time, if you feel that you want to say any comments, please just step up to the microphone. And... We have, the, we have the room for another 40 minutes, so if you've thought of more you'd like to say. Come on up, ma'am. My name is Karen Smith. I'm here for the Light Heat Program, and I understand how things Cutting back on electricity, gas bill, rent, and other utilities. We have to fight for this program for no matter what everyone in this room can tell you about this problem. Um, I, myself, I have my own apartment, me and my roommate, we stick together, we buy food, we pay our rent, we go shopping, Together, we have to budget out our income and anything else. This thank you will let me share. How you doing? My name is Maurice Leftwich. Um, I'm a student at Temple University. Um, so this entire past winter, I have an apartment. I have an apartment near Temple. I don't live on campus. I live with my roommate. And this past winter, the entire winter, we went without any heat. So um, you know, for me, you know, I'm more blessed than others. I could just stay on campus for most of the day with uh, you know uh, with friends that live on campus, stay at the tech center, student center, so I can get heat. So I just went home at night. But I know while I was there, my hands would just go numb because it was like so cold. And me and me and my roommate. So I know for a fact people can't live like that. Like, you know, especially the elderly, young children, there's no way they could live like that. For me, you know, I could just get, you know, really thick covers and all that. But there's no way you can be there for like while you're awake and all. There's no way. 
So I'm I'm wholly aware that lie heap is extremely necessary. So um, that's all I have to say. Nice. Gotta thank him for sitting the whole time, though. That's for sure. You want to come back up? and the senators and city council and Philadelphia council and, and so forth. Everybody's aware of that, of this, uh, uh, of the hearing of today? That? Yes. Yeah, with, uh, when we, po we posted our state plan online and we, uh, at the time we announced all of our public hearing dates, we also have another one on Tuesday in Harrisburg and one next Thursday in Pittsburgh. So we do them across the state. Uh, and we also did send out uh, social media blasts on Twitter and Facebook and make it aware to our uh, advisory committees who have representatives across the state so that they can get the word out on this for all of the, uh, the people who need to be here. Okay, because I, um, um, myself and my son, we belong to various uh, organizations having to do with special needs children. Um, and uh, if they were aware of this, I know they would have been outside, right? <laughs> you know, protesting. Um, they they had no idea about this, um, and I, I, I know it, it just so happens that the fact that it is the day after um, the Fourth of July, it, it makes it kind of complicated um, for them. Um, for them to be notified or made aware of um, this this public hearing, um, I'm just I'm just <coughs> surprised that uh, uh, the, our public officials is even considering this. I, I don't understand. What, I mean, because there's so many families that are in need of this, um, and I don't I don't understand. Is this it has to do with the Trump? Um, I mean, is this, is this what he he's that, that, proposing? That's a part of it. We, we are pro what what we have posted is how we're proposing to run the program the next coming up in the next season, and we basically had to estimate um, what we think we will get as far as funding so that we can run the program appropriately. Mm -hmm. and, and so, as a part of that, that's why we projected what we projected is because of the uncertainty with President Trump mm -hmm. and, uh, and and the current. So, so he's handing the, <laughs> he's transferring all the, all this to you guys. So he's not actually verbally saying, okay, I'm cutting this, 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 and this. He's he's transferring to y'all. Babes, I mean, it, it's not as simple as that, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, because so, he don't want he don't want to take, um, uh, he don't want to be the blame. The the department's budget for LIHEAP is based on the federal budget. Mm -hmm. So we know that, we don't know, we're just basically projecting. Okay, so do you know the percentage of families that will be affected by this, besides this little this group right here, because um, well, 
this group is to take into account your public input. Um, we have information on past families. We have information on how much it costs and how many weeks we believe we can continue the program. And you are program. also from Harrisburg? I am. Okay. Sir, and you are as well? No, he's from here. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, I, I'm, just, I'm just trying to, because this is a small percentage <laughs> compared to the broad. Nobody knows about this. Um, nobody is completely unaware. I, I've talked to um, people that I used to work with at Alvin. Um, I, I talked to uh, um, my, my family, um, you know, and, and other, other people in my neighborhood um, who are on their way to work. Um, they are completely unaware of, of this, what's going on. Um, I'm like the resource lady. <laughs> Again, I don't know if anybody has walked in or out in the past few minutes, but we are 
done with our scheduled speakers, so if anybody has any comments, they are welcome to speak. We have their own oh. as well. Wonderful. It's really make my heart feel very good to hear some of the things that some of the things that our people are going through hurts my heart. My name is Juliet Bay and I live at 1940 South Street and I have been having a few problems that in reference to finances and paying my bill, I'm a senior citizen. My income has been Social Security. I have a property that has been damaged in uh, apartments. I have not been able to rent them because of the condition that uh, have fallen into because of my illness and lack of income. I had a part, I had a barber shop and my income came from my barber shop and when I fell and lost all my income and just wasn't able to do very much for myself. And I was just wondering, I had an electric bill from a tenant that moved out and my property just fell so low and because I had a fire and I wasn't able to do the repairs and I didn't know really what to do, how I was going to get my apartments fixed up. By myself, I'm just about 80 and um, I was just so lost there for a while after falling and slipping on the ice and, and just thinking about myself and my problems and there's so many people that have problems and I, I don't know, I just want to come and say, I'll tell you what my problem a little bit. I have nobody to tell them all my problems. I figured I'd come up in and tell you some of my problems. So, but what happened was when my tenant moved out, the last tenant moved out, he left an electric bill uh, in one of the apartments. I mean, the electric bill was just about $700. And I was told that I had to pay that bill. Now, my bill for the month was only $50, but I had to pay that bill $700, and my income was just a $1,085. And I had to pay everything, all my utilities, all my mm -hmm. services that I needed, food and survival. And they told me that I had to pay this electric bill or my electricity would be turned off. And I'm telling you, it really had been a problem. So I finally was able to get an agreement that I would pay my bill and the tenant bill that they left monthly for on each bill. Now my income is that I want to get Social Security. I have been, it has been very difficult, but I'm getting a little bit out of it now. I have now a tenant, and I'm so happy that I'm able to kind of pay my bills a little bit better. And I'm just so happy that I was able to come up here and tell you. 
because I, I don't have anybody to tell my problems to. And I just, so many people are suffering, and I just wanted to, and I'm thankful for having this opportunity. Because it just takes a little burden off of me when I can tell my problems to someone. Thank you. We don't have their specific stances on those. Um, you know, it is, it is, uh, it has been said up here that it does, the Lighty program does have a lot of bipartisan support uh, within both the House and the Senate. Um, you know, so, but again, uh, I don't have their specific policies in front of me. Um, I, I know for sure that Bob Case, Senator Casey, is a staunch supporter of it. Yes. Um, as far as uh, Senator Toomey, I'm not sure where he stands on that. So, um, again, uh, for those who do not, is this the right flyer? Yeah. Uh, for those who aren't aware, we do have some flock brochures up here as well uh, that have some of the details on the upcoming LIHEAP season as well as contact information for representatives. Um, and these are updated with the November 1st start date. They are the most recent versions. Nice. Feel free to grab one on your way out. Well, yeah. Or if you grab one, please come and grab an update. <laughs> um, good morning. My name is Makara. Um, Miss Angela, home care assistant. Um, as I look around the room today, I see that I'm the youngest one in here. So I kind of feel like it's like my responsibility to kind of speak for the younger generation. Um, I myself is a 24 year old um, married woman with two kids that have disabilities. And um, I I see with, um, I had to use LAHI, um, I'll say last year. Um, I think that cutting, cutting LAHI would make a big difference, not just for the low income families, because uh, in black and white, I'm not considered a low income. But I try to tell them, you know, that's what's in black and white is not necessarily me because they look at me and my husband income and I've been working for five years and my husband he worked for Amtrak and he um fixes the tracks so they look at us like we're um, a well-off wealthy family you know we got money and that's not the case he's 26 I'm 24 you know raising two kids even those two parents in the house and it can be hard to you know and these resources look at us and say, well, no, you don't qualify, you know. So um, sometimes I had to just let them know that um, it's, it, it is hard out here. Being young, being, I don't care how old you are. I don't care what um, career you in, you know. We all have our struggles, you know. We all in the same sea, but in different boats. And um, a lot of people like to climb their way to the top by knocking people down. I call that passing judgment. And I think passing judgment on someone is not going to stop you from drowning, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And um, I just want to say, you know, when you come in this world and as soon as you have kids, they look at you, you know, you're adult now. You're responsible for yourself to stand the fourth. But... Um, you got to have experience out here, and we looking like, well, we only 20 something. How you expect us to have 10 years or so experience? And I think it's it's really 
cutthroat hard out here. And I seen that once I had my first daughter when I was 18, that, you know, it's time to grow up. It's, 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 it's really hard out here. And I can just sympathize, really sympathize for the senior citizens, the people that's out here that only have one income, you know, that's trying to make it. And some days they don't even know how they're going to make it because they're getting this one income monthly, you know. So that's why I see why they, you know, kind of shy away from me and my husband because they say, okay, y'all bringing in money. But that money is gone. Like, you know, your, your income pretty much stay the same, but your expenses and everything around you constantly go, you know, goes up. You know, you can have this emergency with the car, stuff like that. And it kind of, you know, shy away from sometimes you got to sacrifice. I'm like, okay, we're going to put this much down on this bill. We'll get that, you know, two weeks later or so like that. Um, if y'all can just reconsider, not just for the young people, but more so for these people out here that really depend on this help, you know, they don't have much help. They only have this income once a month that's supposed to cover all of their living expenses. You know, I just think y'all should, like they should re really think about this because they are really about to take a, a great effect on many people's lives that they don't even, they don't even know. That's all I gotta say. Thank y'all for that. Good afternoon. My name is Ruth Burchett and I'm a senior. And uh, I first learned about LIHEAP in 1985 when I was administrative aide for Senator Roxanne Jones, a welfare activist. And the first bill she introduced, um, it was shot down. And she was crying. She called me crying. And I said, what's wrong? She said, I don't understand why people don't want to help poor people. Mm. And she said, I can't do this, Ruth. I'm coming home. And this was, <laughs> this was January, because she was sworn in on, on uh, January 1st. Um, and so I, I wanted to know what was like. Um, it broke her heart. The funding of LIHEAP is so critical. I know it now myself, having benefited from it. I became catastrophically ill in the fall of 2014. Actually lost my life, but uh, God saw fit for me to come back. And I know he didn't bring me back just to pay bills. <laughs> And I actually saw them doing CPR on me. <laughs> so, um, it is really degrading for you uh, not to have the funds to be able to honor your debt. When all of your life, you have honored your debt. Mm -hmm. um, I come from a family that believes in paying your debt. Um, even after my father passed away, I still paid off his debts to clear his name because that's the kind of man he was. And so people in need aren't all people who are shucking and jiving and slipping and sliding and, you know, trying to get over. They're people who have an abundance of need. And I stand here as someone who has worked for the Senate of Pennsylvania, the House of Representatives, and the Mayor's Office. But I relied on LIHEAP. I am also a person who is disabled. I don't have my label with me today, y'all forgive me, y'all gonna have to guess. Um, but I say that to say that it's not fair how people have to juggle. It is impossible to stay warm in this city. 
in the winter time if you are a person that's low income. I will tell you that last spring I turned off, um, once the weather got a blink of sunshine, I turned my gas off. My gas was off for five months. Why was that? Because I could not afford $134 a month budget on my Social Security disability. I simply could not afford it. Because when I became ill, actually since then to now, my health has gone into foreclosure three times. Um, and so I would say to you to let us, the public, know what we can do and who we need to um, stick up in the right kind of way. Because I believe in lobbying, and I can lobby, and I will lobby, and I am an organizer. Um, what we can do and who we, whose heart we need to touch. Because that's what Roxy did. Roxy went to Harrisburg and she kept saying, I'm going to educate them. I'm going to educate them. And that's exactly what she did. She brought elected officials down here to Philadelphia to see. Because there's animosity toward Philadelphia because Philadelphia eats up the biggest piece of the state budget pie. And we know that there are 67 counties in Philadelphia. Philadelphia, we think that we're all there, and, and it's just us. <laughs> but it's not. There are 67 counties, and from Philadelphia to Erie, Pennsylvania, the northern west tip is eight hours away. And Pennsylvania is a rural state. I speak as someone who has run a shelter, who has done outreach for the mentally ill, who's run group homes for the mentally ill. And I would tell you that one of the things that is needed so that LIHEAP dollars aren't exhausted is um, an effort toward uh, alternative energy methods, such as solar in particular. Free. God gives sun. Yes. Let's get it free. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Stop paying PGW all this money because, and they're relentless, and having a moratorium doesn't do any good. My, my students and I, during the summer lunch program also, the summer program, the summer job program, we have, we started possibly uh, one of the first really organized uh, buddy systems during the summer to check on our elders and make sure they're not victims of, of heat stroke. Uh, and through that, we learned that people have their windows shut, sometimes painted shut, and the, it, when they're not able to afford bars. So that's their uh, security, but it locks out ventilation also. And so the concern for line heating isn't just for the cold months, but it's also for the hot month. Mm -hmm. um, we were blessed with our program to, um, uh, was asked by the Department of Health to come and explain to the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration uh, what it was that we was doing and why we were doing it at a community-based level. Um, and they were so impressed by uh, the collaboration between a fire department, a corporation for aging, and uh, community-based organizations that they wanted to, us to put us on a bus and take us on tour with them because they were touring the country trying to get answers. It was a very, very hot summer during the 90s, and they were touring the country, and people were dying. I mean, a lot of people died in Chicago. Yes. People died here as well. One of my summer youth workers, who is now a SEPTA driver, um, her grandfather died that very summer while she herself was going with us to do outreach uh, in our community. And so um, I am so grateful to Community Legal Services, of which I used to be a trustee, and I'm, I'm just so grateful uh, to them for uh, bringing you here today. 
Um, I'm grateful that you all are here. I don't know who all of you are, but um, I'm grateful to give voice to the concerns of people, um, all of whom have critical needs, and all of whom uh, deserve the dignity um, to live in comfort like everybody else and not have to do as I have done and get dressed and go to bed. Thank you. We have time for one more if there's any last any last speaker. We only have a few minutes left. Uh, but I will again remind you, if you already grabbed the brochure when you came in, please come up and grab an updated version. And if you didn't get a chance to grab one, grab one on your way out.